There were five orbiters that were launched and landed here at Kennedy Space Center. They were the Challenger, the Columbia, the Endeavour, the Discovery, and the Atlantis. But there were at least six other orbiters that never made it to space. Orbiters like this one, the Inspiration. Welcome to Scientific Drinking. And today, we're gonna to be talking about the orbiters that were forgotten. Wait, 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 no, no, we can't. I gotta, I gotta fill this up first. All right, there we go, there we go. Okay, all right. Mm. Cheers. All right, guys, hey, and welcome to uh, episode 14 of Scientific Drinking. So today I'm drinking Florida Sunshine Lager. Um, it's, it's a lager, you know, it's a lager. Actually, it's pretty good. It's good for hot days. All right, guys, as we mentioned before, today's episode is on the orbiters that never made it to space, the lost orbiters. Kind of a dramatic title, you know, kind of a clickbaity, but that's what we're talking about. And it actually is pretty interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on with these uh, almost orbiters, these pseudo orbiters that it's kind of worth talking about and looking into. As we mentioned before, there were five space shuttles, the Challenger, the Columbia, the DEA Atlantis, the Endeavour, and the Discovery, all of which made it to space. Two of those were, of course, lost to catastrophic failures caused by human error, the Challenger and the Columbia. And the three remaining, the Atlantis, the Endeavour, and the Discovery, are all located here at KSC, at the uh, Udvar Hazy Center in Virginia and the California Science Center in Los Angeles, respectively. Perhaps the most famous example of a space shuttle that never made it space is, of course, the Enterprise. Now, that's famous for many reasons, one, of course, being the name, but Enterprise itself was almost an orbiting vehicle, an actual orbiter that went to space. It was missing some key systems, such as the reaction control system, but all that could have been added on afterwards, and in fact, they almost did that. The Enterprise itself, after completing a series of glide tests, was considered to be almost ready for flight. They were going to retrofit it with updated systems, a reaction control system, and get it ready to go. Unfortunately, at that time, several modifications were made to the orbiter design itself, some pretty major structural modifications that would have made an augmentation or a retrofit of the Enterprise a little bit expensive. And so they moved the Enterprise to the Smithsonian Center's hangar in Washington, D.C., where it sat for quite a long time. Now, in 1986, when the Challenger disaster had occurred, they once again considered using the Enterprise as a replacement. But after a cost-benefit analysis, they concluded that the Enterprise itself would have been too expensive to upgrade, and instead, spare parts for the Atlantis and the Discovery were used to build the Endeavour, the last space shuttle ever to be built. Now let's address the elephant in the room, of course, the name of the Enterprise. Now, although there have been other real ships named Enterprise, such as the one we stole and renamed from the British back in the Revolutionary War, a World War II era aircraft carrier, the CV-6, and the CVN-65, on which my father served during the Vietnam War, more. The original name for the space shuttle was the Constitution, but because of the overwhelming amount of support from Trekkies, an order from the president, although he didn't specifically mention the Trekkies, said that he was fond of the name, and thus they changed the name from Constitution to Enterprise, and hence USS Enterprise it is. So the Enterprise is the only one of the uh, orders that I'm going to talk about that actually had a real chance of making it into orbit. Others were used as mock-ups or replicas. Now, there's a slight difference between mock-up and replica. Mock-up being something used as a demonstration or an educational tool, where a replica is usually a very precise model or representation of the real thing. However, I'm not really gonna get into semantics here, and all the ones I'm gonna talk about are just mock-ups or replicas or kind of a bit of both. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the Inspiration. No, not the one we talked about in the very beginning of the video. There's actually two Inspirations. That's right. The first one was made by the Space Shuttle's primary contractor, North American Rockwell, who used it as kind of a demonstration of their concept of the Space Shuttle. It was made out of steel, plastic, and wood, uh, is, and is a one-to-one -one size of what the Space Shuttle ultimately turned into. Now, this mock-up remained in storage for years until someone decided, hey, let's pull it out and use it as kind of a... Uh, uh, as an educational tool, a mock-up. And so they pulled it out of storage and estimated the value for its reconstruction at 1.88 million. That included half of that funding for the building of facilities and a building and everything else needed to support the shuttle itself. Sorry, it's not a shuttle, it's an orbiter. The shuttle, as you see behind me, is the entire assembly 
The orbiter is the vehicle itself, while the SRBs are on either side and the central fuel tank in the middle, which is the only disposable part of the space shuttle. Now, eventually $3 million was allocated to the refurbishment of this inspiration, but it ultimately kind of went to waste. I'm not exactly sure where all that money went, but what I do know is that it's currently sitting in storage in Downey, California, and it cost over $100,000 just to move it from its previous storage location into its current storage location, which is an outdoor kind of hangar. Kind of a waste. So if, you, uh, if you're out there and you wanna have a space shuttle for a demonstration purpose somewhere in the world, there's one available. Now the next example is the Pathfinder, one of two of our not quite orbiters to have an OV designation. Now the OV designation was an orbiting vehicle dash number, 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 something used to represent uh, the, the specific vehicle that we're referring to. It's kind of along the lines of FA-18 or F-35, but it's very specific to each individual vehicle as they all had their own nuances and differences. Now the P Pathfinder was OV-98. Uh, Enterprise OV-101, Challenger OV-99, Columbia OV-102, and so on. Now, the Pathfinder was a full one-to-one -one mock up of the orbiter itself. It actually had the same weight as the space shuttle, even though it was made of just steel and wood. It was used as kind of a way for the ground to support crew to kind of get a feel of moving the shuttle around and getting into place, attaching it to the fuel tank. It had six missions, none of which were space missions, of course. It didn't have any actual avionics equipment, reactor control thrusters, it didn't even have engines. It was just a mock-up, a Pathfinder. Now, for most of my viewers, this isn't gonna be a new phrase. The Pathfinder is something we use for all new systems. In fact, we just had a Pathfinder core stage come in for the SLS for the crews here at Kennedy Space Center to practice with and get it mounted into position uh, and get used to dealing with such a large object. Same story with the Pathfinder here. It was used as just kind of as an acclimation tool. Now the next one is the Independence. The Independence was a mock-up and not a replica. It was just used as kind of an education and demonstration tool here at Kennedy Space Center. In fact, it was at the Visitor Center here at Kennedy Space Center for a very long time before it was eventually moved. Now when we found out that Kennedy Space Center was going to be the site where the Atlantis was going to be delivered after its final mission, STS-135, we delivered the Independence to Houston, Texas. Now a fun fact about the Independence, it was formally called the Explorer when it was first put in place. Now that brings us to inspiration number two. Yep, that's right, the one you saw at the beginning of the video. Now this mock-up is a full one-to-one -one scale, just like the others of the actual orbiter. But after the discontinuation of the shuttle program in 2011, it was moved to the shuttle landing facility where it was taken over by an independent company which intends to use it as an educational tool. They're gonna put it in a barge and go from port to port to places in the United States that otherwise wouldn't get a chance to see a shuttle or a mock-up shuttle at the very least and uh, use it to show what the full story of the space shuttle was and what value it was to the country and indeed to the history of spaceflight. Now this brings us to another named orbiter, the Amicidia, which is something probably not a lot of people know about, especially not in the United States. This is the only orbiter mock-up that I know of that is located outside of the United States. It's located at the Euro Space Center in, I might butcher this name, Transine, Belgium. Transine, maybe, I don't know, different R, right? Transine, and maybe it's Flemish, I, I, I don't know. So it's a full-scale mock-up that's just used for educational purposes. It's not a replica, it doesn't have all the thousand switches, but there it is. I'm just telling you it's there. Now, another named uh, orbiter is the America. It was used as a tourist attraction for Six Flags in Illinois. It was a motion simulator ride where uh, visitors to the theme park were allowed to develop all kinds of misconceptions about spaceflight. Where sp shuttles would deliver people to and from the Earth's surface all the way to the moon. You can hop on the shuttle and have this full-blown fun ride through space. It's not that simple. Why would you put wings on a lunar vehicle? It's just dead weight. Well, spacecraft don't need wings. Maybe in the future when you have uh, a ridiculous amount of energy that allows you to perform insane delta V maneuvers like we see in the expanse. Well, maybe then we can have wings on our spaceships, but for now, it's just, it's ridiculous. The idea of using a space shuttle to go to the moon, it's absurd. What's wrong with you? Now, our final named example isn't a full space shuttle, but it does have an interesting story. This is the shuttle Resolution, which is really just a cockpit mock-up, but the, the amount of detail that was put in this cockpit mock-up is extraordinary especially considering that this mock-up was a privately done endeavor. Now, the resolution was built by an engineer named Chuck Ryan, who started building this cockpit in, uh, in California as a labor of love. And when he got a job out here, he brought his cockpit with him. In fact, it's still out here in Merritt Island, Florida, just outside of Kennedy Space Center, rotting away in a field somewhere. But it has over a thousand switches. In fact, the cockpit is a full replica of the actual space shuttle cockpit, except it doesn't really connect to anything. 
the reaction control system isn't there, there are no wings, it's just the cockpit. But the fact that someone took the time to painstakingly assemble all of these switches, which if you haven't seen the Space Shuttle Operator's Manual, I highly suggest you check it out. It, it's astonishing how many analog switches there were in the Space Shuttle. Now the next example is the last example with an OV designation, of course OV being orbiting vehicle, and it's OV-95. OV-95 is also known as SAIL, Shuttle Avionics Integrations Laboratory, and it was used as a simulator for the astronauts in Houston. Now eventually the plan is to move this into a tourist attraction there at the uh, Houston Space Center Visitor Complex, but that just has hasn't happened yet, so maybe. Let's hope we get lucky. Now, the very last example that I'm gonna talk about is the FFT. It doesn't have an orbiting vehicle designation. It doesn't even have a full name. The FFT is the full flight trainer, another example that was used as a training aid for the astronauts. Now this has since been relocated to Seattle, Washington and is on display at one of the museums there. Now that doesn't really include all examples of the space shuttle. Now of course many movies have used the space shuttle and there have been other mock-ups and just kind of props used for movies such as the movie Moontrap which used the Camelot and the Intrepid as CGI or model-based uh, space shuttles. And we can get into all of these little models and demonstrators that were used for the space shuttle, but really we'd have our hands full. So what I covered here was pretty much just the big pieces of hardware, you know? Now it would be kind of blasphemous if I talked about all of these almost space shuttles and didn't even mention the Buran. Now, there are some really great videos out there about the Buran, and they're worth watching, especially one that I have in the link below by Mustard. But the Buran is another example of a space shuttle or a orbiter that never really flew. It was built by the Russians, and it pretty much was just like the space shuttle system that we have here in the United States, or had in the United States. And in fact, the Buran might have been a little bit better than our own space shuttle, because they were able to sit back and observe the mistakes and the challenges that were faced with our own space shuttle program and improve upon that. However, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Buran never came to be. There are only two existing, one of which is rotting away in a hangar, and the other is on display somewhere in Russia. So that's it, thanks for watching. I encourage you to dig a little deeper and learn a little bit more about the history and uh, the fascinating backstories of all of these almost orbiters. So cheers, thanks for watching. All right guys, we came out here to film the orbiter, but we got an extra special bonus today. That behind me is Mars 2020. It's being wheeled off the aircraft now for storage prior to launch later this year. If you think about it, that's going to Mars. It's pretty exciting. <laughs>